Hello and welcome back to the Luckbox podcast. I'm Sujoy Roy. Today joining me is Ian Smith from the Esports Integrity Coalition. Thanks for joining us, Ian. Thanks, no problem. Great to be here. Um, so we wanted to talk about ESIC a bit because you've been in the news uh, and recently, just for full disclosure, Luckbox have just joined ESIC as well. We made that announcement last week. Um, I just uh, Let me read out your mission statement to, to make sure everyone's aware of who you are. Uh, to be the recognized guardian of the sporting integrity of esports and to take responsibility for disruption, prevention, investigation and prosecution of all forms of cheating, including but not limited to match manipulation and doping. So, uh, yeah, t tell us about ESIC. What, it, does that describe yeah. who you are or has, has, uh, has it changed from the mission statement? No, well, look, that's pretty accurate. I mean, I think the um, giving it, that, that sounds like a pretty narrow um, kind of mission to a lot of people, but obviously it, it covers a range of things. I, I've been in esports for three years now and I, I, I learn something new literally every day. Um, you know, in esports terms, I'm I'm almost a veteran these days, which says a lot about the industry uh, in, uh, in in that sense. But obviously, you know, I'm dealing with guys who've been around since the beginning, um, and they have a wealth of experience. And, and and so, what what we set out to do and wrote that mission statement back in the back end of 2015, three years ago. Whilst it remains the same, what has changed is my priorities within that. The, what I've learned, for example, is that I thought that doping was far bigger problem than it is. And I'll qualify that to say we actually don't know how big a problem doping is in esports. But when I took over, there was a lot of controversy uh, at the end of 2015 arising from Corey Friesen's statements, the Cloud9 stuff. Uh, ESL having very rapidly introduced a doping program and a ton of rumors, you know, typical social media stuff about widespread doping in certain scenes, certain games. Um, so my experience since we took over the anti-doping program for ESL in uh, March 2016 is that uh, we've had no positives. I mean, we've tested, uh, I think, 300 players now, something like 400 tests overall. Um, I, I receive all the therapeutic use exemptions we've had. You know, there's nothing in that process that leads me to believe that there's a problem. Uh, but, but I'm also conscious that we're really only dealing with the top end of Counter-Strike, a bit of StarCraft, a bit of League of Legends, a little bit of Dota. And that what we have no idea about is what's going on in other scenes and in lower tiers of those games, particularly in the online scene. Um, so... Whilst I thought that would be a massive issue for us, it turns out that uh, it probably isn't, or at least if it is, there's very little we can do about it because we don't have the resources to go around knocking on team house doors in California saying, hey, would you mind having a pee in this jar for me, please? Um, that, that, that's not going to happen. Um, but where, where we have found a lot of issues um, is around the match-fixing side. We know that cheating in esports, and I mean amateur, lower level competitive uh, video gaming, cheating to win is absolutely endemic. I mean, there are hundreds of guys being, being back banned and banned on other platforms on a, on a monthly basis. But again, it's very rare at the top level. The sort of esports I'm interested in is, you know, in, in effect, professional top tier esports. Um, and cheating is rare. I mean, obviously, we've had a very recent occurrence, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. But on the whole, it, it's rare. What is not rare across the spectrum, really, is, is uh, match manipulation brought on by betting fraud. And you'll be aware, obviously, uh, uh, from a luck box perspective, this is very, very important, is that betting fraud drives about 90, 92% of match fixing in all sports worldwide. And it's really people trying to turn their bets into an investment by ensuring the outcome um, by various different methods, you know. And it's been uh, prominent in esports since 2014 15 with the emergence of a very, very large skins betting scene in Counter Strike and Dota 2. 
Um, as soon as skins were effectively turned into a virtual currency and people could cash out on them, the gambling scene grew exponentially, but there was no regulation behind that and very little control. Yeah, I've um, got to say that... Um, operations I, were poorly run. Well, I, I've been in esports for a long time and I, I, I wasn't really aware that match fixing was a problem until I yeah. stopped to actually look at the problem. Yeah, I mean, look, similarly for me, I mean, my background is in traditional sport and I had an awful lot to do, unfortunately, with uh, match fixing cases, primarily in cricket, but also in other sports. So I, I had a good idea of the mechanics of it all. What really surprised me um, when, I, when I was first asked to look at esports was, firstly, the level of gambling on an activity I really had no idea about. I mean, I didn't know what a skin was. So when I first started looking um, at eSport in the summer of 2015, people said, oh, you've got to check out CSGO Lounge and, uh, and skins betting. I honestly had no idea what they were talking about. I mean, at that point in my life, I barely knew what CSGO was, never mind the fact that there were these uh, crates with skins in and that these had acquired some third-party value. I mean, the whole world was just weird to me. I mean, obviously, I, I, I had to pick it up pretty quickly. But part of that process was to do a review in early 2016 of all of the betting in Counter-Strike in 2015. Um, Valve were very helpful in a process of effectively helping me or commissioning me to uh, and, and ESIC to do a review of the previous year's betting. And when we did that, um, bearing in mind the data was not great, um, but but we exposed, with the help of Sport Radar, over 150 potentially fixed matches in, in Counter-Strike in 2015. And, and you've got to bear in mind that at that point in, this, in the esports betting world, there were only really three um, cash betting markets available to, to bettors on esports. There was Pinnacle, I think there was one called Esports Gaming, and there was one other. But, but if you wanted to bet on eSports, you really had to use skins, you know, unless you could res register with one of the, the three uh, online operators offering eSports at that point. Um, Unicorn had just been set up, and, but, but wasn't trading yet. Um, but there were about six, 60 or 70 skins betting sites, and that was a new world to me. Um, and we, we did that examination. We looked at those games. Now, as I say, the data was... So we can't say for certain that there were 150 fixed matches, but it's likely that a fairly high percentage of those uh, anomalous betting matches were fixed because it, nobody was looking for it. It was so easy to do and the value was there. So we know about a few cases. We know about Epsilon. We know about um, uh, I buy power and so on, but there were a hell of a lot more than that, a hell of a lot more. And uh, the, and, uh, and I'm only looking at one game, and, and that game, whilst it accounts for you know over 40, 40 something percent of the betting on esports, nevertheless there was another let's say 55 percent to 60 percent of betting turnover was on other games, uh, primarily Dota 2 uh, at around 20, 20 something percent, but. There's no way that the fixing was, was confined to, to CSGO. And so that, that was quite an eye opener. And um, you know, it, it shifted my priority very, very quickly, or ESIC's priority as an organization to dealing with match fixing and betting fraud more than cheating. Because cheating was actually, we found, whilst it was rife, was reasonably well dealt with by the publishers and tournament platforms. Um, firstly, they were all running anti-cheat software, and, and we can argue about the effectiveness of that, but it certainly is a deterrent to low-level Mickey Mouse fixing, uh, not fix, sorry, uh, cheating. And it exposes literally hundreds of people every month. Um, uh, and I'm sure that there is very sophisticated cheat software running. I mean, it's a perpetual arms race. It's, there's always some cheat, um, and, and I don't understand their motives, but there we go. Um, constantly trying to outwit the anti-cheat and find ways of cheating, which is mind-boggling, really. I mean, but, but there we are. Um, but at least everyone's aware of it. And historically, the, the platforms and publishers 
have come down very, very hard on cheese. You know, we've had automatic life bans, back bans, um, all of these things. And so for the most part, what I found is that the industry deals with cheating reasonably well. You know, as a lawyer, I hate the lack of process and the lack of system behind it. But on the whole, everybody is geared up for looking for cheats and dealing with them. And what that means is that they're weeded out at a pretty low level of the game. And it's very, very rare in my experience for these guys to reach uh, a semi-pro, pro uh, or high, you know, tier one level and still be cheating because the cheats have either been weeded out or uh, the scrutiny of the game by your opponents and by the community is such that it's very, very hard to get away with cheating. And, and the costs of doing so are so high that I think it's a deterrent um, to, to people. So long story short, we're, we're focused now very much on match fixing, um, despite the fact that currently we're in the news for dealing with a cheating case. Well, yeah, and on that subject, we should probably talk about Forsaken because that's blown up in the news recently. Um, so the story is it was in Optic India. They were playing in Shanghai and a hack was discovered on his PC um, by an admin it was quite like it, it was such a strange thing because we we're watching the live stream and you can actually see the moment the admin finds software on his pc and he's having a tussle with him it's, it's surreal almost um but after the thing is though forsaken this was this was a player playing in a top tier tournament basically uh and he has a history and and that's probably why this has blown up so much as well it's because he was um, known for being back banned in the past and Isik has dealt with him in the past, maybe leniently. Um, and this is what the community is saying is maybe Isik's penalty that, that's been applied to Forsaken, is it too lenient? It's a five-year ban and this is for a second offense. People think he should be gone forever. They, they probably would uh, string him up from a tree if they could. Um is is five years enough? Should it should he never play again? Because that that's certainly what the community is calling for. Yeah, sure. Look, I I understand that, and and at a personal level, I'd like to never see him back um, in, in in the Counter Strike or any esports scene. But let let's step back a bit. I mean, firstly, the idea that this was a second offence in in the Vacban case uh, from from uh, the end of last year. There was a, an account to which he was connected that was back banned. I investigated that and we banned him for two years, which is an appropriate first offense sanction for this on the basis that he was the player that cheated uh, and, and that being back banned um, obviously uh, meant that he was in breach of, of um, Bell's terms of service, both in terms of what he did uh, in, in um, allegedly cheating on that account, but also then in selling that account on, in trading that account. So he effectively boosted it and sold it. What he was able to show me in, in, by way of appeal following my uh, or ESIC's decision was that both technically and actually, he had never, uh, act, he had never owned that account. Um, and, and I had evidence of that, um, which, which um, he provided. I checked that out. So basically, he had taken over an account, which obviously is a breach of Vell's terms of service. He had boosted that account uh, and then sold it, which, you know, whilst again, obviously against Vell's terms of service is a very common practice in certain um, CS and other uh, communities, very common. Um, and in fact, uh, I, I have probably a query a week from players who have, who have fallen into the same trap as Forsaken um, uh, in terms of acquiring a VAC ban because an account that they boosted or were associated with has subsequently become VAC ban. So what, what he was able to show in that case is that he was not the player that cheated on that account. I'm not saying he never cheated, but now, of course, I think he did, but not on that account. And so uh, for breach of Bell's terms of service, um, I felt a six-month sanction was appropriate um, and, and in fact really falls outside of my jurisdiction um, because I was there to deal with cheating and 
uh, whilst there was a misdemeanor, there was, at the end of the day, no actual evidence of cheating on that account. Um, the backbone was, was not uh, when he was using the account. So I didn't regard this offence when it was uncovered with Optic India um, in the uh, ESL India Premier League, uh, Premiership as a second offence. I, I guess it was a one and a half offence, if you know what I mean. Um, now, even so, right, even so, I, I have a natural antipathy as a lawyer towards lifetime bans. I, I feel like I completely understand the community. And I've been in traditional sport where we've had similar calls in multiple sports for cheats. But the, the analogy being um, primarily around doping is it, it, people hate losing to cheats. And I completely understand that. But, you know, there's, there's 20 years of case law that says that uh, in, in doping cases, a first offence, a four-year ban, which has only been for the last couple of years, because historically it was a two-year ban for doping. Um, and in the last three or four years, it's been a four-year um, ban for doping. Is the appropriate legally sanctioned um, sanction? That's been tested in the European Court of Human Rights. It's been tested before CAS. It's been tested in, in, in courts of law and is regarded legally as reasonable. Now, to that degree, my decision um, to offer and, and uh, the, the sanction that was accepted uh, at the end of the day by Forsaken of a five-year ban is consistent with what happens in other sports and is at the harsh end of that. So, in other words, the, the way in which people regard cheating in doping is very, very different to the way in which they regard cheating in traditional sports or on-field offenses like, for example, um, diving in football. So you might get a yellow card. In extreme cases, you might get a red card. But you're not banned for anything but the rest of the game. I mean, if you've accumulated red cards, you might have a three-game suspension, right? Uh, if if you're caught, as a couple of people have been recently, with an engine in your bike in a cycle race, right, uh, built into the frame, an energy-saving device, those guys are being given two-year bans, some one-year bans. So in other words, yes, cheating is abhorrent, and I completely understand the community's reaction. But five years in the context of traditional sports sanctions for cheating is actually very harsh, very harsh. A lifetime ban is, is up there with, you know, major match-fixing scandals, um, second offences, third offences. You know, you, you, could, you could have steroided yourself to the gills and won an Olympic gold medal uh, in, in the 100-metre men's final, and you would not get banned for doing that if it was your first offence for as long as we have banned Forsaken for using a software hack. So... I'm comfortable that we got this right in, and in proportion, but I, am, I have tremendous sympathy for the community's desire to punish these people. Um, but it's not my job to enforce mob rule. It's my job to be reasonable, proportionate, and follow due process, and at the end of the day, be, do what's right for esports. And in my view, five years uh, is right. I, th I think what the reason people are, are railing against this is because okay so i was trying to draw comparisons but as you said putting an engine in a in a bike is just outrageous i didn't even know that yeah. that happened um but but with esports we're talking top level esports but if if cheats are prevalent and hacks and aimbots and wall hacks and all of these things what they do is destroy the entire foundation of esports. And these are just the public servers where people play and enjoy and learn the game. And cheating in that absolutely destroys um, that foundation, the infrastructure yeah. of esports. Because of all, all of the online playing, if you're worried there's a cheat, you, you, you can't really have fun. And because yeah. a lot of video gaming is online, it's very difficult to know whether or not it's happening and knowing whether yeah. the anti-cheat is working. So so maybe, uh, and this is me as an esports fan talking, sure, maybe sure. it's more of a problem in esports because 
it entirely ruins the fun of playing these video games online. Yeah, look, I, I'm completely with you on this. I'm a gamer myself. I remember some cheat basically in, in um, Rainbow Six, uh, The Division. I had accumulated a lot of loot and some guy shot me through a wall, flew down, took all my stuff and disappeared. I, I never played the game again, right? Because it had taken me months to get to that point. Similarly, uh, I've quit a, a number of mobile games for exactly the same reason. And, uh, you know, it related to being cheated. And I understand, and this is exactly why publishers take cheating so seriously, is that if you consider uh, people who play the game as opposed to esports, so let's say with League of Legends, let's say their figure, Riot's figures are right and they've got 100 million people playing League of Legends. If, uh, if somebody, uh, and, and esports is the cherry on top, you're looking at, what, 400 guys, tops, making a living out of, out of League of Legends esports, right? Um, it, it's a marketing tool. It's, it's of very little financial consequence. Um, as a separate entity to Riot. I mean, it probably annually at best accounts for like one fifth of one month's income to them. So the, the 100 million people are absolutely key to Riot and they protect those people, which is why they are so hard on cheats. And, and the same applies to Valve or Blizzard or any, any game. Um, and, and I completely get that, the whole idea of the, the VAC ban, because I'm, I'm with you on that one. I hate being cheated, and it undermines the whole basis of, of your enjoyment of the game. So, so I, I understand that. And at amateur level, it drives me nuts. And I've got no problem with Valve coming in and saying, right, you, you cheated in CS, you're out, uh, in, in terms of a VAC ban. But I think in esports, you've got, to, you, you've got to draw a line somewhere between your average or, or below average gamer like me uh, some considerably lousy gamer like me and, 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 and the professionals. And the professionals, you know, cheating is a sporting uh, misdemeanor. In, in amateur games, you're, you're looking at a major commercial impact to the cheating um, because people will migrate. If you, if, you're, if you get cheated in league, you, you're going to stop playing league and you might play Dota, right, or, or some other game. That's going to drive right nuts. They're going to lose money. So, of course, they come down like a ton of bricks and they try and eradicate that. But in esports, you, you, you've got to think of esports, to my mind, much more like um, the difference between, uh, sorry, that's my phone, uh, the difference between, for example, you and me kicking a ball on a, on a patch of grass and calling it football and Manchester United playing Manchester City uh, uh, in the Etihad, uh, that's esports. That's Man City versus Man U, Man U. You and me kicking a ball is not is not esports in that sense. We're playing the same game, but we're not playing the same game. Yeah. And and so I focus on esports and I treat it as a sport, and I look at it in that context. So I think that's where i'm coming from i i think saying that some guy cheating at esports deserves a life ban is a is a visceral reaction because they're they're screwing with your sport with, with your game right yeah. it, it's not actually a rational and proportional reaction to somebody cheating at sport if you take if you go outside the csgo community um, and outside of the esports community and say, is a five-year ban for cheating proportionate? Most people with a sporting background and knowledge would agree that it is. And in fact, most people in my world of sports lawyers and traditional sport administration regulation would say it's harsh. And, and that has been the reaction I've had from you know, people who've called me up from the sports law fraternity and from the sports administration uh, regulation fraternity all going, wow, five years. That's heavy. Okay. Well, can I challenge you on one more thing then as well? I'd just like to say that, of course, as, as has been pointed out by a number of commentators on this, a five-year ban in CS is a lifetime ban, let's be honest. You're not going to be out of CS for five years and come back. Yeah. Okay. 
yeah and who knows what'll be what the, our industry will look like in five years yeah, everything yeah. changes so quickly yeah. here um i wanted to challenge you on on one more thing mm -hmm. which is a lot of people still view ESIC with um uh, suspicion it's it sure. and and you know when i when i first heard about ESIC, because you've only been running for what just over two years um, yeah three years but officially two and a two coming up to two and a half yeah yeah, and so we launched officially on in July 2016. Uh, but we had, of course, existed for for about eight months before that. Well, the the question that comes to mind is why why is this outside agency coming in, getting involved in our thing? And, and you know, this is this is a protectionist sort of idea that people in esports yeah. tend to have. Uh, and it's like, well, can't ESL police themselves? Can't um, PGL sort out their tool. Valve should be doing this. Why? Why are ESIC here? What's the need for for ESIC? Why? Why can't this just be done? And and you understand, I'm I'm just trying to push you for an answer. Is is yeah, why, yeah. why can't it but be done by our guys? Um, why is yeah. ESIC needed? That's a that's a, I mean, look, it's a perfectly valid question. I mean, the first and flippant answer is because they weren't doing it. Uh, but but that is a flippant answer. That, that that's not correct. The way, the way that ESIC came about was uh, was at the direction of esports rather than, you know, I didn't one day look at, at this thing called esports and go, hey, you know what? These guys, th there's a gap here. I'm going to step into this gap. I, when I was asked to look at esports, I didn't know what esports was. You know, I, I was a gamer. Um, so I, I'm a lawyer and, and I worked in traditional sports. I, I've been a gamer all my life. I mean, literally from standing in cafes in South Africa as a, as a young man playing asteroids. That's how far back I go in terms of gaming. But I was not a competitive online gamer, right? I, I played console games. I played a lot of mobile games, but I don't consider that eSport really. Um, and, and also as rubbish. But so when MTG called me up um, back, in the summer of 2015. And they did that because they had discovered something on the acquisition of, um, of ESL. And in the process of doing, uh, doing due diligence on DreamHack at the time and saying, look, what, what we've bought here is in effect, and, and I'm summarizing and they may disagree with me, but what we've bought here is in effect access to millions and millions of uh, young men primarily, but a demographic that is incredibly hard to reach and who don't tend to watch traditional media. That demographic, and at the time, you've got to bear in mind that ESL, the platform had about 5.8 million users. So just in that alone, never mind the LAN events and the tournaments and the Twitch cover and all that stuff, you know, they, they, they had a big demographic there. And what, what that should have meant was about... 30 to 40 percent non-endemic sponsor engagement at absolute tier one levels. It should have been Visa, Amex, Emirates Airlines, Toyota. You know, but it wasn't. It, it, it was. It wasn't Coca-Cola. It was Mountain Dew. It, it you know. It was. And 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 the engagement, the non-endemic engagement with esports at that point was below five percent. Okay, and this is despite IEM Katowice having 40,000 people through the door for three days in a row, or the Frankfurt Major having 9,000 people rammed in, 12,000. So from a commercial point of view, it wasn't working in the way that it should have. And, and they wanted to know why, because here was this media giant, you know, Scandinavian media giant entering into the space and kind of going, What's this? If we had these figures, we'd be we'd be making a fortune with non-endemic sponsors. So how come how come esports isn't? So they they asked a guy to have a look at this, and of course the answer is very complex. So you know, I'm not pretending that I could solve that or provide you with a detailed answer. There's a ton of reasons why that was, but what it boils down to at that stage was that firstly. Esports was the Wild West, and I, I'm not, I hate hearing that these days, but it really was. And there was no center to the industry. There was nowhere to go. Let's say you wanted to, 
to sponsor esports. Where did, where did you go? In 2015, you had to go to individually to these companies. And for a company like Coca-Cola, they're not going to go to ESL. They're not going to go to DreamHack, PGL, MLG as it was, and so on, because they were Mickey Mouse. They were tiny. You know, these guys are spending millions. They're not going and spending 50 grand here and 20 grand there and 100 grand there, which in those days, that's more or less all you could do in esports. And part of the reason was that the guys who, who do this buying for, for these tier one uh, top end sponsors, um, non endemics, were a bunch of old guys like me who wouldn't know esports if it bit them in the ass. And then, um, on top of that, so, so esports was not getting the visibility. And secondly, there was no regulation. There was no governing body. There was no brand protection. Is what it boiled down to is that you were taking a hell of a risk with these organizations and people were not prepared to take that risk. And they felt that, uh, that, that the integrity risk was very, very high. Now, they didn't really understand what that meant, which is where I was then approached in, in the summer of 2015 to do an integrity threat assessment from the background of traditional sport. And that's what I did. But the funny thing is for me is that I didn't, I had no idea what esports was. So a guy phoning me up from Stockholm saying, hey, will you do this threat assessment on this thing called esports? I was, I was like, what are you talking about? Is this FIFA being played online or you know, what, what's the deal? And they started talking to me about League of Legends and Dota 2 and Counter-Strike. I'd never even heard of these games. And so, and MOBAs and these sort of things. So, you know, I went back and said, look, I'm very happy to do this work because it falls within my expertise. But you've got to give me a couple of months to look at esports, just, just, to, just to research what it is. And what I found as I'm sure has happened to many, many people over the last couple of years as it's reached the mainstream, is there's this parallel universe called esports, which if you were in my position, as, as most of the world is, you didn't know it existed. It was there, but you couldn't see it. It was an underground scene. And until you turned and looked at it like a magic eye picture and you stared at it and stared at it, and then suddenly, boom, there it was. And it took me a couple of months to realize that. Having, having done that and looked at you know, what, what were the problems, what were the threats, and as I've already said earlier, around match fixing in particular, the betting scene was a huge shock to me. The skins, this billion dollar skins market running parallel, and bear in mind, my whole life is steeped in sports betting. I didn't know this existed. And so I had to, the obvious question when you identify these risks is, what's the solution? And normally the solution from somebody like me would be, well, you know, here's the measures you need to implement. And then you go to the governing body of the sport. Uh, so you go to FIFA or the IAAF or the NFL or NBA, and you say, hey, guys, this is what you need to do. You hand them a program. But in eSport, that didn't exist. There was nowhere to go. I mean, where, where did you go? You know, IESF was two blokes in an office in Seoul. Nobody I spoke to in esports gave them any credence at the time. Um, there, there was nowhere to go. And so the only answer when, when I was asked was you have to create, you have to create a coalition of like-minded people because, you know, going back to your original premise, of course, ESL could just do something on their own. MLG could do something, Valve could, you know, Valve couldn't, because they never will. But, so, but Blizzard could do something, um, you know, Riot could do something. But they weren't for a start. And, and also what that would ultimately mean is that esports as a, as a generic concept would end up with 50 different systems trying to deal with the same problem. And if you were in Counter-Strike, for example, let's say at the time you were Luminosity and, and Fallen, you know, prior to SK Gaming, prior to MIBR, you played in um, E-League, ESL Pro League, IEM, ECS, Blast Series, blah, blah, blah. And every event you went to had a different set of rules or no rules, no procedures, drug testing here, no drug testing there. 
it, it was just a mess. And, and so trying to create some consistency was seemed to me very, very important at the time. So that the scene addressed its common problems. So I completely recognize that each game has its own issue, right? So the, the Counter-Strike scene is very different to the Dota scene, very different to the League of Legends scene, weirdly. Um, very different to the Tekken scene or the Super Smash Bros. scene. There's a spectrum. And they all have their own communities and own cultures and, and, and these sort of things. I completely get that. But within that umbrella term esports, with all its components, which is like saying the Olympics, you know, we have our 100 meter men's final, we have our synchronized swimming at the other end, and our equestrianism and our weightlifting, and our esports is like that. But like the Olympics, there are certain common problems, right? And I think there are three in esports. I think there is youth protection because we have a very young demographic. And I think that whether you're uh, a couple of fans of Super Smash Bros or you're 100 million fans of League of Legends, there's still a youth protection issue across that whole spectrum. The second one, and I hope is blindingly obvious, is live event safety. You know, we've seen that with the Madden tournament. But whether you're throwing 50 guys in a pub or 45,000 people in the Spodek arena, you've got a live event safety issue there, right? And that's common across all communities, all games. And the third is integrity. It's the same problem. Whether you're betting on Tekken 5 or Warcraft 3 in some Mickey Mouse tournament in China, or you're betting on the finals of IEM Katowice, it's the same problem. Right? It's the same set of issues, cheating, match fixing, betting fraud, doping. So I believe that the esports community has to recognize this commonality and deal with it consistently. But there was nowhere to go with that idea, right? So what I proposed at the time to MTG um, was a coalition, uh, is to start getting all the stakeholders engaged in a joint enterprise. I had zero intention of running that. I, what I thought I was doing was handing over an idea to um, effectively to ESL as things stood at the time and saying, right, boys, that's what you need to do. And I would go back to my cozy, quiet life in traditional sport. But what they actually did was said, well, will you do it for us? And similarly, I thought, well, yeah, I can. I had time at the time, actually. And I thought, yeah, I can do that. I'll set it up and we'll find a, an esports guy, to, somebody from the community to come in and run it, right? So, and I would just hand it over and, and again, go back to my normal life. The truth is in that period, that sort of three, four month period at the beginning of 2016 in particular, I got into it. I started to enjoy the community. I started to enjoy the vibrancy of it. But, and I certainly enjoyed the opportunity to shape something from the beginning um, because that's very rare for any lawyer or anybody in sport. You know, I've been dealing with a sport that's been around for 150 years. Everything took forever to change. Um, the evolution was, you know, you felt like you were wading through a, a, a swamp. In esports, everything was happening. Boom, boom, boom. One, you know. And of course, there were massive challenges, and there are, there are problems within the esports community in terms of maturity, professionalization, strange beefs that go back 10 years and have no relevance to the current scene, but still have an impact on it, jealousies, rivalries, all this rubbish. But it's an awesome place to be. So the truth is, from an ESIC point of view, is that I probably shouldn't be in charge of ESIC, but I am. Uh, I don't think I'm an outsider anymore. I don't consider myself that. Um, certainly relative to most people coming into the esports industry recently, I, I, I go back to you know, the fact that I am almost a veteran in esport terms these days. But it, it, this is a hell of a long way of saying that I thought and, and still believe that there is a necessity for ESIC. I don't believe anybody else from the community was going to come out and just do it. Partly because they didn't have the experience and knowledge, but partly because everyone in esports is so horrendously busy and under-resourced that 
the idea that somebody would kind of pop their head up and go, hey, you know what? We should we should have a look at this whole match fixing, cheating, integrity area. And I'm just the guy to do that, despite the fact that I have zero experience of this. But, you know, I'm well embedded in the esports community, so I'll do it. Um, I, I don't believe that was ever going to happen. Um, and I don't believe that any individual company can attack this problem because it's a trans industry problem. This is not an ESL problem. It's not a DreamHack problem. It's not an LVP problem. It's not a Luckbox problem. You know, it, with Luckbox joining ESIC, you've joined 18 other betting operators and regulators in a common cause because, you know, it's your problem, but it's also esports betting problem. And it's the same on our esports membership side. This is an ESL problem. It's a DreamHack problem. It's an LVP. It's a UMG. It's a Challenge Me problem. But really, it's an esports industry problem. And as soon as people from their individual silos look up and realize that, I think they'll realize that ESIC is a good thing. We're completely nonpartisan. You know, we, we, we are game neutral. We are tournament platform neutral. We're publisher neutral. Uh, in every single way, we offer a kind of one-stop integrity solution that doesn't create conflicts. We have no commercial program. We don't. You know, we don't license events. We don't. We don't have sponsors. So we're not conflicting with anyone uh, within within the esports community. What I see is they're all conflicting with each other, and I think that those jealousies uh, and rivalries and competitions stop people from engaging with us because they have this misconception, either that we're outsiders, and I don't believe we are anymore, and secondly. Because, because of our history and the way in which we were founded back in 2015-16, there are still people out there who think we're an ESL thing. Hmm. Um, we're not. You know, ESL, of course, we wouldn't exist without ESL. So, you know, kudos, because they basically funded the first couple of years of our existence. And, and there would be no ESIC but for ESL. But ESL are a member of ESIC with exactly the same status as every other member of ESIC. They, they have the same status as our smallest member in terms of vote and influence. And they have never, ever told me what to do. Um, can I, and can I, ask, and can I ask, how, how, how has the rest of the industry the the um, indus reacted to ESIC? How, have they embraced you as uh, an independent body or have they have there been resistance because of your initial connection to ESIC? Yeah. Oh, look, both. Absolutely both. It kind of depends where people are coming from, where they see themselves in the ecosystem. And so the acceptance amongst most of the publishers has been great from day one, and we've cooperated. Um, and, you know, Valve don't regard themselves as an esports company, but they're, they're always, and particularly on the CSGO side, I, I can't speak for the Dota side because they, they don't engage. But, but the CSGO side, we've worked closely with them literally from day one. Um, we have a good relationship with Blizzard, with Nate at the Overwatch League, with you know, with with some, some of the guys at Riot. The the resistance, on the other hand, so the other side of things is that these days, both from the betting and the but the the smaller tournament organizer end in esports, we we now get approaches directly from those guys for membership, and I think the. The resistance comes from those few tournament organizer companies that see themselves as genuine rivals or competition to um, ESL and to some extent, say, DreamHack, where um, they don't want to be seen as second mover or riding on the coattails or joining you know, something that is an ESL project. Um, and so... At the bottom end, your smaller guys have no problem because they don't see themselves as in competition with ESL. ESL are the gorilla in the room. They obviously are. You know, they're the biggest esports company in the world by some considerable margin. They have influence in a lot of places. They've, of course, by virtue of their success um, and other operations, have enemies within the industry. I, I, I get that completely. But... So for those guys at the top end of esports organization, their rivals uh, have resistance 
to us. Um, but I think they all know now that we are an independent organization and they have, you know, they have their own reasons for either doing their own thing or continuing to do nothing, which unfortunately uh, is the case with quite a number of tournament organizers who just have no provision for dealing with this at all. Um, and, and that's sad, I think, you know, and, and I'm, but I'm confident that we'll overcome this over the next couple of years. I think that resistance is, is declining and declining. Uh, as people get to know me and ESIC better, um, they realize that you know, I'm really not one for being um, influenced or, or told what to do. We're an independent organization. You know, we, we're going to do what I think is right um, and what our members think is right. You know, we're, we're owned by our members. And, and so if they all got together and decided I was the wrong guy to run it, that's that's their right, you know. I don't own it. Nobody owns it, um, and uh, and to that extent, we are free to to operate without undue influence from other people. And uh, I hope more and more people recognise that and come to see that that you know they shouldn't fear joining us. So there's there's an awful lot to benefit from getting involved with us. Okay, one last question for you then, Ian. As somebody who's come into esports, uh, become very involved in the whole scene and seen um, over the last two years, probably the, the quickest change in, in any kind of industry that I can imagine. It's, it's gone from something that was an underground passion to, to a worldwide phenomenon in a way. What, what yeah. do you see as the future of esports and what, what are the major challenges you think we, we have still yet to face? Yeah. Look, it's, uh, I see the future as uh, extremely good growth. I think there are a lot of un, um, uh, un, uh, variables and unknowns in that. But let me tell you why I think it's different to the the, the bubbles that, that happened in eSports before, is that in, in those periods when eSports looked like it was going to be the next big thing, it was still very much confined to its community. The difference with this current uh, growth, and I, I won't call it a bubble because I don't believe it is, the current growth has reached the mainstream. This time, as esports grows exponentially, there are an awful lot more outsiders involved. So it is not necessarily purely community driven anymore. There are people like me, there are non endemic sponsors now of the likes of Mercedes, Samsung, you know, high end. Uh, non-endemic sponsors. There's a lot more awareness. I mean, just one example would be the IOC's um, flirtation with um, with esports, with the summit in Lausanne in back in July. So it's reached mainstream consciousness and continued to grow. And yes, there are naysayers on the outside looking, and uh, we hear this all the time. I you know, who cares? It's basically a bunch of old men like me looking at it going, it's not a sport. Um, and you think, well, who cares? Who cares? It is what it is. Uh, it's, it's the key entertainment engagement with the vast majority of the key future demographic. And so I see that as almost a guarantee of success. But that's not to say that within esports, a huge amount is not going to change. Parts of it are going to fail. Games are going to fade. You know, I mean, with the best will in the world, nobody can tell me with certainty that the Overwatch League is going to succeed, right? It may not. Um, I hope it will. It, it's a kind of worthy experiment in a sense. But there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee that in five years, CSGO will still be the, the top uh, first-person shooter. There's no guarantee that League of Legends will survive the arrival of a new MOBA. Th this makes esport really strange, you know, in, in that sense. We don't know the impact, for example, of um, uh, the rise of Battle Royale. We don't know the impact of increased technology and, and better provision in VR and AR. So, but it's very, very exciting despite the fact that there are going to be winners and losers and that in five years time, there'll probably be a top tier esport that currently isn't even a game yet. The trajectory of the industry is upwards. There will be winners and losers for sure, but I see massive growth. I see the biggest challenge being 
being the issue of governance um, and the, you know, to bring it back to my world, the very muddled interface between esports and betting on esports. Because at the moment, there's an abyss there. In Western Europe, it's not so bad. I mean, your experience with Luckbox undoubtedly be that the acceptance of, say, uh, headline sponsorship by a betting operator like Luckbox is easily accepted in, in Western Europe. It, there's no issue there. We're in a highly regulated uh, sports betting environment that's been around for years and years and years, and people will say, okay, esports, maybe it's a sport, maybe it isn't. But betting on it is exactly like betting on sport, right? It's the same thing. It behaves the same way. And so there's a growing understanding between Western European and Eastern European esports and betting on Western and Eastern European esports. But the same is not true of North American esports, and it's not true of Asian esports. Despite the fact that on both North American and Asian esports, the betting is in the billions of dollars, right? <laughs> but the people who run esports don't really understand the betting on esports in those environments. And there's no proper interface between the two. And that's a significant challenge because the growth of betting on esports also means the growth of temptation to interfere and to start manipulating esports. And if you don't understand that and you don't put measures in place to address it, you are looking for disaster. So the, the challenge is, how do, we, how do we bridge that gap? How do we bridge that abyss in a way that doesn't involve reacting to some major crisis or scandal? Because that's coming. Mm. And, and I guess my position on this is, is just purely pragmatic given my, my background. I am not an advocate for gambling. I'm not out there going, hey, we should have betting on esports. What I am is a pragmatist. I'm saying there is betting on esports. It, it's a multi-billion dollar industry and it's growing rapidly. Um, you've got to react to that, whether you like it or not. Uh, we know that Blizzard historically and, and Riot historically and certainly Valve uh, have a have a tremendous antipathy towards betting on their esports. They don't like it. They're unhappy about it. But it, that's not enough. You can be as unhappy as you like, but if you don't do anything about it, it's not going to go away. You know, nobody's going to suddenly stop offering markets on on League of Legends just because Riot don't like the fact that markets are offered on League of Legends. It's right up there in the tough luck category. Just, it's going to happen. So the only thing is, the only question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to engage with the betting industry? Are you going to put measures in place? Are you going to engage with ESIC? Are you going to do something? What are you going to do? And that's, that I see as honestly the biggest challenge uh, is what, what, how are we going to address this? Um, I'm sure there are tons of other challenges, but those are not my challenge. My challenge is, how are we going to get the esports industry to deal with the fact that there is a lot of betting on esports? Uh, that's the challenge. Okay. Well, um, I'm very glad that you're helping us face these challenges. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. And this is, we're wrapping up the podcast here. If you're watching this on YouTube and you don't want to see these beautiful faces, uh, you, we're also available on SoundCloud and Spotify. And if you're listening, you can see our faces on youtube so thanks again and and that was a luckbox podcast see you next time <laughs>